Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus made seven times the statement, I am. He used this statement to reveal this title of a self-existent God. Jesus says, I am here in the beginning, and I am the foundation of hope. And the power of hope is, I am the resurrection, I am life. And because Jesus Christ is the resurrection, we have the guarantee that we will be resurrected with a new heavenly body, a body that will never grow old or tired, and there will be no more tears. So as we take the bread today, your body of life, we thank you, Lord, for hope, faith, and trust, and eternity with you. O risen Christ, make this cup for us the blood of our resurrected Lord. By your Spirit, unite us with the risen Jesus, that we might see him here and everywhere we go. As we embody the gift of his resurrection in our lives and in our world. So help us see you risen, present, and at work in our world. And to join you in making all things new until you come again in glory and we feast again with you for all eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. On the night of the Last Supper, Jesus sat with his disciples and told them that he was going somewhere that they could not go. He was going to give them something to remember him by. So he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and said, take this and eat it. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Let us all take the bread together now. In the same way, he took the cup. He blessed it, told them this is his blood, the blood of everlasting sin. He was shed for them. I'm so sorry. This is the blood, and it was shed for them to, for the forgiveness of sins. Take this in remembrance of him. Let us all drink the cup together now. Let us pray. On this Easter, Lord, we can do nothing but sing your praise. We thank you for everything you give to us. You died for us, but more importantly, you were risen. You conquered death. Now we have a glimpse of you here today when we share the bread and the cup. Help us to see you risen, present, and at work in our, in our world. Help us join you in making all things new. Until you come again in glory, and we feast again with you for all eternity. Amen. Amen. reading this morning is Acts 10 verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is 
that God does not show favoritism, but accepts every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the providence, province of Judah, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. And now Miss Carol has a message for the children, if they would all like to come forward and hear her message. And afterwards, there will be children's church for children 4 to 10. Thank you. Come on down. Hello. I'm so glad you're here. I have something that I want to show you. Um, I've got a picture. And I wonder if you can tell me what that is. Do you have any idea what that could be? Oh, my gosh, I'm surprised because it's, it, it's an egg. Aren't you going to go eat your egg honey this morning? Does, does that look like any egg you've ever been hunting for? Well, I have to tell you that a friend of ours out here, Mr. Jim Braswell, is a fantastic photographer, and he took a series of pictures that I want to share with you, and this is an egg that he took a picture of. Now, that egg is so tiny, it's... it's I don't even know how tiny it would be to compare it to a, a dot. Uh, if you took a, a crayon and made a dot on the paper, that's how big that egg would be. It's a tiny little egg. But that egg hatches into something that looks like this. Do you know what that is? Yeah. It's a caterpillar. It's a really beautiful caterpillar with yellow and black and white stripes. Just gorgeous. Now those get to be really big. They're about as big as my little finger. They'll get really fat because they eat lots of leaves and they get fat and they grow and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when they get really big, they do something funny. Almost. Ah. 
they turn into this. That is called a chrysalis. Isn't that a funny word? Kind of sounds like crystals. Turns into a chrysalis. And they are so beautiful. When they turn into that chrysalis, they actually have gold. It's almost like a jewel. They are just so beautiful. But it's not moving. It looks like it's dead. We go from that very active caterpillar to this thing that just looks dead. And it sits there for about two weeks. And all of a sudden, something happens. This butterfly comes out of that chrysalis. This dead-looking thing, this dead-looking thing turns into this gorgeous butterfly. Now, the reason I'm sharing those with you today is because I thought maybe that might help you understand about Jesus. You know, we've been talking about how Jesus was, we, we celebrated his birth at Christmas, didn't we? We thought that was just a wonderful event. And then he turned into a little boy, and he grew, and then he turned into a man, and he became a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And then something terrible happened. The people around him did not like him, and they killed him. And they put him in a cave and thought he was dead. And something miraculous happened. Just like this cocoon, Jesus was in a cave. And he came out of that cave and lives today in spirit, just like this butterfly came out of that cocoon and flies all over, and we love watching them. So anytime you see a butterfly, be reminded of how Jesus came out of the cave and is alive in spirit. And to help you remember that, I have a gift for you. Okay? And I'm going to give that to you, and I'm going to let Miss Deb lead you to Children's Church. Okay? But before she does that, after I give you your butterfly, let's have a prayer real fast. Because I know you want to get to Children's Church. Butterfly. There you go, Eli. I'll put it in your dump truck. There. Okay? There you go. Shall we pray for a second? Father, we thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of your spirit, for knowing that even in death, we live. He lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. kiddos are an absolute blast. Easter egg hunting, if you want to go Easter egg hunting, it's not too late to go find some Easter eggs. I hear there's some good candy in there. Not the melted chocolate, the good jelly beans. All right. Speaking of kids, um, as we're making our way to Easter egg hunting, um, for those of you who don't know, I have two daughters, okay? And uh, we currently have our third daughter on the way. Michaela, right? Yay! Woohoo! 
Now, there is a trend going around. People our age who are having kids, you do not tell people the name of your child before the baby's born. And I thought, what in the world is that all about? Why not? Why not just say the name? And so we did that with our first. We said, Sage is her name. So we told people when we were pregnant with Sage, we said, her name is Sage. And everybody went, oh, that's the cutest name. I've. Oh, that's so good. And we were like, all right, cool. We're going to do it again with our second one. Um, our second daughter is named after a great literary character um, named Sam. And so our daughter, who's named Sam, when we told people, we're going to name her Sam, everybody goes, oh, <laughs> nice. That, that's beautiful. Beautiful. And so I'm going to do this with the third one. You guys don't go, oh, nice, okay? Give us a good reaction here, okay? We're going to name her Sawyer, another great literary character. Oh, how cute, how precious. All right. Now, there is, as, as strange as the McMullins' names might be, uh, there's a guy we're going to hear about today who has an even stranger name, okay? His name is Corn Elias. Cornelius. Sorry if any of your names are Cornelius. That's a name that when you tell somebody, they're going to go, oh, nice, <laughs> nice. Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman, okay? This is during Jesus has died. He's already been resurrected. And this guy named Cornelius is a Roman, but he believes in Jesus. Do you guys remember who killed Jesus? The Romans, all right? The Romans killed Jesus, but this guy Cornelius believes in Jesus, and he believes in God, and he is known as someone who gives to the poor, all right? Think Mother Teresa. She's known for giving to the poor, and he's also known for praying, all right? And so one day he goes and he bows his head and he's praying, and an angel appears to him, and the angel says, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer. You need to go find Peter. Do you remember who Peter is? Peter's a disciple of Jesus, the disciple of Jesus, if you will. He's the, the, the rock in which the church will be built. So Cornelius is praying, and an angel comes and says, you need to go find Peter and hear Peter's story. Okay? You need to go find Peter and hear Peter's story. Uh, Christians today... I think people are asking you some of the same questions. People are praying to hear your story. People are sitting here, they're going to eat lunch with you today, and they're going to wonder, why do you still go to church? Why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you continue praying, reading your Bible? Why do you continue Christian traditions? Like, there's, like why? Why do you do that? People need to hear your story. They need to know why you believe in Jesus. They need to know why on Easter Sunday you come to church and go, he's, a, he's risen, he is risen, he is risen indeed, right? They need to know why your children are begging you to tell them why. They want to know why, and it has to be better than that song you sing to your children uh, you played this one, Deb. It's not the one you just played. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. That answer isn't good enough. It's not. The answer isn't good enough to the person saying, why do you believe in Jesus? You can't say, because the Bible tells me so. Because guess who else has a Bible? Guess who else has a book? The Buddhists have a book. The Hindus have a book, the Muslims have a book, the Jews have a book, the so-and-sos have a book, the atheists have as many self-help books as you can get. Every time I go to Barnes & Noble, I'm like, Dad, gum, there's a lot of self-help books here, all right? Everybody has a book, so the book isn't going to be the answer to why. Now, you guys, for those of you who know me, know that I preach this every single Sunday, 52 weeks a year. Unless it's this week, then it's four services in a week. I preach from this Bible here. I love the Bible. I bet in the last five years I haven't read the Bible for five days. Okay, I love it. But it's not what people need to hear when they ask you, why do you still believe in Jesus? Guess what they need to hear? The same thing Cornelius needed to hear. Peter's story. 
Tell us your story, Peter. And Peter does. Peter shows up. And Peter tells the story. You know, I was feeling I didn't even open my sermon yet. Everyone has a book, so tell them the story. Okay, you can't open the book and go, on the night before Christmas, I don't know how the rest of it goes, but that's not even in the Bible, right? Okay, that's not the Bible. It doesn't work. Okay, everyone has a book. The book should inform what you believe, but you've got to know why you believe it. So why don't you tell them the story you heard a couple weeks ago from Anita Jacks? She's been praying for 60 years for her son to draw close to Jesus. And guess what? A month ago, he called and said, hey, mom, I want to pursue Jesus with you. She's, that's 60 years of prayer. And guess what Anita felt in that moment? The Holy Spirit. Why don't you be like Lauren who said, I'm tired of feeling like the world's controlling my life. I want to be baptized. And she comes in Lent and gets baptized in our baptistry and says, I felt the Lord when I came up out of the waters. Why don't you be like Matt who says, I saw this keychain I was going to laugh at and I did laugh at. But then one day when I looked at it and realized I needed Jesus, Jesus became real. Why don't you tell them about the time their dad left and you hit your knees in prayer and you felt the spirit lift you up and bring some peace. Why don't you tell them the story? about sitting in a mission field in the middle of Texas heat and you felt a cold breeze which is non-existent in Texas during the summer come into your soul and you felt God. Why don't you tell them the story about when you prayed, when you read the Bible, when you experienced Jesus. Why don't you tell them that story. That's why you believe because you experienced it. That's the story you got to tell. They already know they already know about Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary. They know about the King James Version with all its he, these, thous, and thems, or these, or I don't even know all the words to it. But they know those. All right, and it's interesting to look at how Peter told his story. But I invite you to tell them your story of why you believe in Jesus. So when you leave here today and you go to Val's, you go to Vinny's, you go to Grandma and Grandpa's house, wherever you're going to eat lunch... Let the conversation be, Grandma, why do you believe in Jesus? And then Grandma, say, Grandson, this is why I believe in Jesus. And then you get to say, and also, Grandson, why do you believe in Jesus? Let that be your Easter conversation. Let that be what you discuss. Cornelius was waiting for Peter to tell his story and I don't think you realize that people are waiting for you to tell them your story too. Of why you believe he is risen. Because Jesus has risen. Jesus has risen and I'm wondering if you are going to rise up and tell people your story. I'm wondering if you are going to rise to the occasion. I'm wondering if you will rise this Easter. Peter tells his story, okay? He says... Several times, we are witnesses. Did y'all see that? We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. This is what I saw. This is what we saw together. The disciples and I saw this. He's telling them his story. But guess how he starts this? He shows up to preach or teach or whatever you want to call it, talk, tell his story to Cornelius. And he says... You know the message God sent to the people of Israel. You know that part. You also know that Jesus came and he healed people. And you also know this. So did, did Peter spend a lot of time on the stuff they already know? Someone say no. Peter didn't sit there and tell them what they know already. Okay, I promise your children, your grandchildren, you, your wife, your husband, your whoever has already heard the Nicene Creed. They've already heard all the, the, the church mumbo jumbo. What they haven't heard is when I experienced Jesus, when I was driving my car, when I answered the phone, when I felt Jesus, this is what happened. Peter didn't waste his time on stuff they already knew. And so let me tell you what you may not know. Something interesting about 
Easter and why we celebrate Easter. Typically, things rise, and when they rise, they then what? They rise and then what? There you go. They rise and then they fall. But with Jesus, you are invited to fall so you can rise. Does that make any sense? With Jesus, you are invited to fall so you can rise. You know it with Jesus. Jesus was buried. He fell into the tomb, died on a cross for three days, and he rose again. You are betting your life that you will get to fall when you die and then be raised up into the glorious heavens above. Yes? Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, John the Baptist began his ministry by baptizing. You literally fall into death and rise up in new life. Peter, in this story, is being invited to fall so that he might rise because Peter has a people problem. Okay, Peter isn't supposed to be in the house of some guy named Cornelius. He's not allowed in there. There is literally a law that says you cannot break bread with Gentiles. That's Romans. Or anybody else not Jewish. But Peter shows up. And he's got this people problem.